Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this presentation on legal ways to help you grow. This is a two part presentation that we are doing regarding the industrial hemp industry. And we're hoping to provide some valuable information to you all. The um, as I said, this is going to be a two part webinar You can go to the next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, this is part one, and we're going to focus today on Virginia law regarding hemp, CBD, and medical cannabis, and we're also going to discuss the federal regulations. The second part of our webinar will be held on June 30th, and in that presentation, we will discuss business considerations for hemp industries and latest developments, and that's going to be again June 30th at 10 a.m., and you can register for part two on our website. This is. Um, um, these are our pictures. I'm Ann Bebo. I'm a law partner with Van Dievender Black. I assist businesses in the, in, in the hemp industry in uh, legal compliance issues. And this is my colleague, Jonathan Gallo. Uh, you can read more about our uh, backgrounds on our websites, but I want to just mention with regard to Jonathan, um, prior to joining our firm, he was a lawyer with the New Hampshire Department of Health and Human Services where he was um, part of the team that implemented New Hampshire's therapeutic cannabis program. He was involved in developing New Hampshire's regulations, application process, and licensure for medical cannabis or therapeutic cannabis. And so he has a great deal of experience in this area. And as I said, you can read more about our backgrounds on our website. Next slide, please. This is uh, what we're gonna be talking about today. We're gonna start off talking about Virginia law, um, where we are with medical cannabis in Virginia, with hemp and CBD. And then we're going to talk about the state of the federal law about cannabis and industrial hemp. And then we will have um, time at the end for questions. With the Teams format, if you wave your mouse over the screen, the little toolbar will pop up and there is a icon down at the bottom with a question mark and that's the question. So if you click on that, you'll get it. Um, a vertical column on the right side of your screen where you can type in questions and we invite you to do that. It's a great way for us to engage with you. And as I said, at the end, we will read those questions and answer as many as we can. If um, for some reason we can't get to a question, we invite you to reach out to us. Our contact information is on the last slide. Finally, I also wanna let you know that we will be making this presentation available to you if you'd like to get these slides um, after the presentation. Next slide, please. All right, so where are we in Virginia? Virginia has moved very slowly into this arena, um, just kind of dipping our toes in and inching into the water, uh, much slower than many other states. So in 2015, Virginia took its first dip um, with allowing, uh, passing a law that allowed the use and possession of CBD oil or THCA oil to treat intractable epilepsy, but it was only that one condition. You couldn't have it for any other medical reason. It was just for intractable epilepsy. And then, <coughs> excuse me, in 2016 and 2017, Virginia expanded that a little bit by allowing um, or authorizing the establishment of five pharmaceutical processors to produce and dispense um, oils, the CBD oil and the THCA oil. One, one pharmaceutical processor per, per health service area. And we have five health service areas in the state. This was, um, you know, this is a very limited uh, rollout of medical cannabis in Virginia. And the pharmaceutical processors are basically uh, a vertical integrated facility where they both grow the, the hemp, I'm sorry, grow the marijuana and process the marijuana and dispense it. So it all takes place in the same facility. The um, program is set up so that it's regulated by the Virginia Board of Pharmacy. Each of these pharmaceutical processors has a pharmacist in charge and that's how the whole thing is run. There are very detailed regulations on how the medical cannabis um, pharmaceutical processors operate and those regulations are in um, the Virginia code where I have the citation there. For the regulations that govern ph pharmaceutical processors. Next slide, please. This is just a map of Virginia showing where those health service areas are. As I said, there are five. These were, these were anticipated to be operational by the end of 2019. None of them are operational yet. I was reading this morning that the one in Stanton 
which was originally licensed to Pharmacan, and then Pharmacan was um, acquired by MedMen. It may not open. It looks like it's um, basically stalled. Currently, it looks like Greenleaf and Richmond might be the closest to coming open, but it's not open yet either. They have on their website that they're anticipating being able to dispense product um, by October. But the other health service uh, pharmaceutical processors are further behind. Next slide, please. So after um, announcing that we were going to have these pharmaceutical processors, Virginia made a few other expansions into medical cannabis. In 2018, Virginia expanded the medical cannabis oil program to be to allow medical cannabis oil for any diagnosed condition or disease upon phys physician recommendations. So that was a pretty big expansion there. And then Virginia also expanded the authority to issue the certifications to nurse practitioners and physician assistants. Virginia has created a registered agent category and that allows um, the patient doesn't have to go directly to the pharmaceutical processor him or herself. The patient can have a registered agent do that for the patient, which makes sense because some of these people would have serious health conditions and have difficulty getting out. Uh, the Virginia has also now authorized that the pharmaceutical processors can distribute, make a wholesale distribution of oils between each other, and that would just be limited to the pharmaceutical processors for the distribution. And they've also expanded the um, products that can be dispensed. Initially, it was just going to be the oils, and now they're allowing um, related items that would contain the oil, such as capsules, topicals, lozenges, lollipops, and suppositories. Next slide, please. Virginia also has an affirmative defense for um, possession of medical cannabis. And this is only in effect right now until July 1, because as Jonathan's going to explain, the General Assembly has changed the law and um, this defense is no longer um, applicable. But up until July 1, Virginia law will have an affirmative defense for criminal, criminal prosecution if someone is caught for possession of uh, CBD oil or THCA oil. Um, it's not a legalization. That's an important distinction. It was never a legalization. It's just an affirmative defense, which means that you can still be arrested for possessing those oils that are derived from cannabis. But if you're arrested and charged with possession, you would have the affirmative defense available under this law. Um, and note that this would not apply to industrial hemp. Um, this is just for the marijuana derived uh, oils. Next slide, please. So the affirmative defense would only be available if the individual has a valid written certification from a board of pharmacy registered physician, physician assistants, physician assistant or licensed nurse practitioner, and the individual is a current active patient or agent registry or has an agent registration issued by the board of pharmacy. Um, if the individual files the valid written certification with the court at least 10 days prior to trial, and provides a copy to the attorney for the Commonwealth, then the written certification is considered prima facie evidence that the oil was possessed pursuant to the valid written certification. So that's how the affirmative defense would play out. But as I said, um, come July 1, that's no longer going to be um, relevant. You can go to the next slide, please. And I'm going to pass this off now to Jonathan. Thank you, Ann. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for attending. Uh, what uh, what we're going to go over here are some of the recent legislative amendments in the last legislative session in Virginia. <clears throat> As Ann mentioned in the very beginning, uh, the original law in Virginia was kind of a, a dip in the pool, so to speak, when it comes to uh, medical cannabis. Um, by contrast, back in 2013, when New Hampshire passed its therapeutic cannabis bill, it was a bit more extensive than that. Although New Hampshire did have to go back to the drawing board and the legislature to amend various laws to um, account for things that um, came up during the process, including amending its regulations. So some of the bills that we're gonna talk about here, uh, we'll, we'll discuss, we'll, um, kind of close some of the gaps that were created in the original laws. The first uh, piece of legislation that came past this uh, legislative session was Senate Bill 976. And as Ann mentioned earlier, the original 
um, law allowed for the five uh, processors in the five uh, health areas um, to serve. Uh, it looks like the legislature, and we had a similar situation in New Hampshire, realized that five processors might not be enough to serve uh, the residents of Virginia. So this particular bill defines a cannabis dispensing facilities. And what it basically does is it expands the reach and capacity of the dispensing facilities in Virginia. It allows the uh, licensed pharmaceutical processors to also have five additional cannabis dispensing facilities, up to five, uh, located in their same health service area to dispense the product. Um, the bill also increases the regulatory authority of the Board of Pharmacy. Uh, it it uh, requires the Board of Pharmacy to issue regulations regarding safely and securely cultivating plants, the maximum number of plants a processor may have, disposal, dosage limitations, registration of products, and also um, allows for the sale of devices for the distribution of inert substances uh, for demonstrative purposes. Um, it also requires analytical laboratories to test samples of processors um, prior to distribution. Um, so that's one piece of legislation that kind of fills in the gaps that were there in the original legislation. And as things move along, it's likely that you're going to see additional changes in the law. Next slide, please. So the next piece of uh, legislation uh, Anne alluded to uh, earlier uh, is Senate, Senate Bill 1015. So while previously um, anybody possessing uh, THCA oil or, uh, or cannabis oil uh, with a certification and registration, it was an affirmative defense, meaning they had to, if they were arrested, they had to present their evidence to the court to show that they actually had a lawful reason to possess it. Uh, SB 1015 modifies the current statutory framework uh, and basically makes it a bar to prosecution. So a person who possesses uh, CBD oil, or THCA oil pursuant to the valid certification shall not be prosecuted for simple possession. And most of these laws go, come into effect on July 1st, 2020. Uh, some of them went into effect earlier because there was an emergency clause in there, but I'll, I'll mention those that go into effect earlier. And the other thing that Senate Bill 1015 does is it provides protections for agents and employees of pharmaceutical processors who possess these particular products uh, previously, the previous law also provided an affirmative defense for them, but now it protects them. So it kind of closes that gap there and provides a, a legal protection for them against prosecution. Uh, the next piece of legislation is uh, HB 16, uh, 1460. And previously, the previous law only allowed pharmaceutical processors to dispense to residents of Virginia. Um, this change in the law now allows pharmaceutical processors to dispense to uh, temporary residents of Virginia who have been issued a valid written certification from the Board of Pharmacy. So it expands access to temporary residents um, as long as they contain the proper certification and registration from the board. Next slide, please. So the next piece of legislation is Senate Bill 885. Um, this one was one of those uh, pieces of legislation that had an emergency clause and it was effective April 9th, 2020 upon its passage. And this provides protections to employees of analytical laboratories. Previously, because of these samples have to be tested by labs, in the previous legislation, there was no protection from prosecution for lab analysts who are going to be testing these products. So this particular piece of law allows uh, legally uh, lab analysts, employees of analytical laboratories to legally possess this for the purposes of testing. And, and basically it says no person employed by an analytical laboratory to retrieve, deliver, or possess any of these products or industrial hemp samples um, <clears throat> can be prosecuted uh, for these as long as they're possessing it with the purposes of testing in accordance with the regulations. The next um, bill is Senate Bill 2, and Senate Bill 2 um, <clears throat> was combined 
<clears throat> excuse me, combined in a uh, with a number of bills. One of the largest uh, pieces of this legislation is that it essentially decriminalizes simple marijuana possession, which is the possession of marijuana up to one ounce. It doesn't legalize marijuana, it decriminalizes it. The legislature took a, a partial step uh, towards legalization. It is actually a decriminalization, and it basically takes simple marijuana possession, possession of one ounce or less, and makes it punishable by a fine. Um, it also states that there's a rebuttable presumption that a possession of no more than one ounce is for personal use and therefore simple possession. It also um, makes some changes to uh, criminal history law, criminal record law, and it basically says um, anybody who uh, receives a summons for this, uh, that's going to be excluded from the criminal history record information. And it also precludes questions from employers and educational institutions and certain government authorities for licensing and permits uh, from asking questions about it. But it, there's a little bit of a nuance in that, and you're going to have to go look at the legislation. <clears throat> it excludes questions if the um, criminal records are not open for public inspection, and they're not open for public inspection if, in fact, the case is, um, is deferred or if it's suspended. Um, so it's it's a little bit of a nuance. It's not a blanket preclusion from asking questions. It only precludes questions from being asked in certain circumstances. The next piece of legislation is Senate Bill 1045, and this one um, directs that uh, processors create homogenized batches of products for testing at independent laboratories in Virginia. So they have to take uh, their product, create a homogenized batch, and they're required to have it tested at an independent laboratory after they've processed it uh, and before it's dispensed. A couple of other um, pieces of legislation I wanted to mention before we moved on that <clears throat> I did not include here for purposes of um, speed because we've got a lot of slides to go through. Um, one of the other pieces of legislation that passed was Senate Bill 185. And that piece of legislation allows nursing homes, assisted living facilities, hospice programs, and hospice facility employees and staff members who are authorized to distribute or administer medications to actually dispense or uh, administer uh, cannabidiol oil or TCA oil to a resident who's been issued a valid written certification. That was an issue in the past. The previous law did not allow um, employees of nursing homes, assisted living facilities, or hospice programs to dispense these particular substances to residents, uh, even if they had a certification. This law allows that. And then the other sets of legislation I just wanted to briefly mention, there was a number of pieces of legislation that um, set up uh, joint legislative committees to study the expansion of cannabis use in the Commonwealth, the legalization of cannabis use in the Commonwealth, and the expansion of the uh, medical cannabis program. Uh, those particular bills were HJ 130 and SJ 67 and HB 347. So uh, in the next couple of years, those study committees are going to meet and come out with some recommendations on any changes in legislation. So it, it shows that the, the Commonwealth is moving forward with regard to the expansion of the medical cannabis program and or the legalization, it would appear, the legalization of uh, cannabis use by adults. Uh, stay tuned. Don't know what's going to happen, but uh, but the legislature is studying it. And um, uh, the other the other piece of legislation I didn't include here for purposes of speed is HB 909, which removes some existing provisions uh, which allow for the person's a person's driver's license uh, from uh, being suspended for certain drug offenses. So that's uh, something to look at as well. Next slide, please. A uh, few more pieces of legislation I'll go through uh, a little bit more quickly. Uh, HB 92, 942, it, this basically directs the Board of Agriculture and Consumer Services to um, mirror federal regulations when it comes to industrial hemp. And that's going to be more important uh, later in the presentation where we talk about industrial hemp and federal control of industrial hemp. Uh, HB 962, 
That prohibits the sale of hemp products intended for smoking uh, to persons under age 21. A number of neighboring states have addressed uh, the this, uh, this sale of smokable hemp in various ways. Um, Virginia's uh, Virginia's take on it was to prohibit it uh, to the sale of persons under the age of 21. Um, HB 1430 and SB 918. Uh, this is important. Uh, and previously mentioned the uh, uh, guidance provided by the governor's office in July of 2019 to consider industrial hemp extract a food a food additive. Uh, here the legislature specifically has come out and said industrial hemp extract is considered, uh, can be considered in foods, used in foods, and it established requirements for production um, in, uh, for the purposes of the creation of food products containing industrial hemp extract. And it also creates the industrial hemp fund, which is going to be used uh, to deposit, uh, you know, the costs of regulation, the cost of any licensing will be deposited there to run these particular programs. And then the uh, final uh, piece of legislation on this particular slide is HB 1670. And that actually permits pharmaceutical processors to acquire industrial hemp uh, grown and processed in Virginia from a registered hemp dealer or processor and allows it to include it and formulate it into their into their um, cannabis products so that so that's important so that the the registered processors can use industrial hemp in their in their products obviously as long as they comply with the uh, regulations regarding the amount of uh, cannabinoids and the amount of tetrahydrocannabinol that they can contain so they can draw the pharmaceutical processes can draw from industrial hemp growers and use uh, extracted um, uh, hemp uh, in their formulations. So that's 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 an important thing as well. Next slide, please. So segueing into industrial hemp. So the industrial hemp program in Virginia is run by the Virginia Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services. Uh, it, it requires um, the registration of growers, processors, and dealers. It requires the records, certain records, uh, propagation reports, um, because now industrial hemp extract is going to be used in food. It now requires the inspection of food establishments, including manufacturers of industrial hemp derived extracts intended for human consumption. It, um, it oversees the establishment and administration of the state program, which we're going to be talking about a little bit later. And it also is responsible uh, for overseeing the random THC testing of industrial hemp crops. Next slide, please. So in Virginia, uh, the production of industrial hemp is broken up into growers, dealers, processors, or agents of growers and it allows them to deal or process industrial hemp, but they have to be registered. Registered is being registered is not a difficult process. Uh, the fees are fairly small, uh, but um, you have to put in certain information, particularly the growers. The growers are required to put in um, a, a good amount of information in their applications. It's an annual registration. It's accepted on a rolling basis. There's no deadline to apply. Uh, growers have to submit a planting report within 14 calendar days after planting. Uh, growers have to put the name and mailing address, the legal description of the uh, land in which on which the hemp is going to be grown. They also have to put geographic coordinates on there so that the land can be located. Um, VDAS is also uh, will also randomly select presently will randomly select uh, hemp production fields during this growing season uh, for sampling using a risk and random analysis. Uh, and if a grower's field is selected, they will be contacted by VDAS according to VDAS by the end of September of this year. So if if the field is selected, it'll be tested. Um, and as in previous years, um, VDAS is going to continue to assess compliance using the hemp's post decarboxyl cop post decarboxylated delta 9 THC, which is the total THC concentration. Obviously, if, if the um, crop goes above that, um, it will be, uh, it'll have to be destroyed. So we, we understand the meaning of industrial hemp. Uh, the Virginia definition is consistent with federal law. Um, and then uh, hemp product, that's the definition of hemp product in the Virginia code. 
Um, and it clearly states that it's any finished product that is otherwise lawful that contains industrial hemp. And it can include things other than, you know, uh, cannabinoids. It can include anything. It can include textiles or anything else that's created out of the hemp plant. Uh, next slide, please. So, uh, as I indicated, um, VDAS is has primary authority uh, over the industrial hemp program for Virginia. However, um, it did submit its plan to the federal government. Uh, it submitted its plan to regulate hemp production to the U.S. Department of Agriculture on January 15th. Uh, they were uh, provided feedback this February, and Virginia expects its plan to be in full effect October 30th, first 20 of this year. In the meantime, um, Virginia will run the industrial hemp program as it has in previous years. And in previous years, prior to the Farm Bill of 2018 and the 2019 amendments to the Virginia industrial hemp laws, um, VDAS ran it uh, through the various institutions of higher education, um, James Madison, University of Virginia, Virginia State University, and Virginia Tech. So they were conducting a research on industrial hemp, and they're still doing so, but um, that was what was going on prior to the 2018 Farm Bill. Virginia will be running its program as it has in the past until the uh, plan is approved by uh, U.S. Department of Agriculture. Next slide. So as we previously said, Virginia is, is pretty communicative with uh, industrial hemp processors, dealers, and growers. Uh, they did notify industrial hemp processors that hemp products containing hemp-derived extracts are considered food. HB 1430 confirm that. Um, if any uh, entity or individual wishes to operate of a ma as a manufacturer of industrial hemp derived extracts intended for human consumption, they have to apply to VDAS, uh, Food Safety Services, Food Safety Program to follow their plan, get an inspection, and those requirements uh, have certain requirements for the accounting for you know levels of heavy metals in the food, uh, setup of their location, labeling of the products. So it's, it's pretty stringent requirements. Additionally, if an uh, individual intends to distribute industrial hemp planting seed in Virginia, they need a seed dealer's license. Uh, through VDAS, and if uh, and if an individual intends to bring hemp clones or plants into VA into Virginia, uh, they need to contact VDAS to determine whether a phytosanitary certificate is needed. Uh, VDAS also um, regulates uh, pesticide use in hemp, um, and we're going to talk a little bit more about this later. But basically, Virginia VDAS is the overarching authority in the state on the industrial hemp program, uh, provided that they are within federal law. So they have to comply with federal law in order to run their program. Uh, and with that, um, I will turn over the next slide to Anne. Thanks, Jonathan. The big federal law, of course, that governs all of this, that um, is one of the reasons this has been kept uh, away from people for so long is the Federal Controlled Substances Act. That law was passed in 1970, and that's the law that regulates the manufacture, importation, possession, use, and distribution of certain substances and imposes penalties for violation of those rules. It categorizes all the regulated substances into one of five schedules based on the substances accepted medical use, potential for abuse, and safety and the potential for addiction. Next slide, please. Marijuana has been classified as a Schedule I drug, and up until recently, so was hemp. Um, so Schedule I drugs are drugs or substances that have a high potential for abuse, have no currently accepted medical use and treatment in the United States, and there's a lack of accepted safety for use of the drug or substance under medical supervision. So other Schedule I drugs are heroin, LSD, and as I mentioned, marijuana, and until recently, hemp was included in there. Um, just as a note here, there are some um, FDA-approved medications that contain the active ingredient dronabinol, which is a synthetic form of THC, 
and it's used to treat chemotherapy, chemotherapy induced nausea and vomiting, as well as some anorexia related to weight loss in patients with AIDS. Um, and one example of that is Marinol. Go to the next slide, please. Just a, some interesting background about hemp. It's, it's, I mean, I find this fascinating because this is a plant that's been with us for thousands of years. Uh, humans have been cultivating it domestically for at least 10,000 years. It's known to have a number of beneficial uses. And up until very recently, it was something that a lot of farmers grew. It was very commonly grown. Famously, the founding fathers all grew um, hemp. Thomas Jefferson, there's a quote from Thomas Jefferson about how hemp is necessary for um, the wealth and protection of the nation. Hemp is such an important crop. So it's kind of remarkable that for a period in our history, it was banned and considered a substance one or a schedule one uh, drug under the Controlled Substance Act. So it, hemp is a variety of the cannabis sat sativa L plant. Um, so again, it is uh, uh, very closely related to marijuana. Um, during the colonial era, Americans were actually required to grow hemp because of its usefulness. In 1937, Congress passed the Marijuana Tax Act, which basically still allowed hemp, but it um, added some uh, penalties for um, for uh, not paying certain taxes, added some taxes and penalties regarding marijuana and hemp. And during World War II, the government even produced a film called Hemp for Victory. You can find it online that encouraged farmers to grow hemp to support the war effort because of all the very um, useful purposes that hemp can be put to. And then it was the Controlled Substance Act, as I mentioned in 1970, that clamped down on that and ended the proliferation of hemp and its usefulness for American farmers. And then the other two laws I'll talk about a little bit later are the farm bills of 2014 and 2018. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned, hemp has a number of documented uses. It, it's really amazing how versatile this plant is and how many different um, purposes it can be put to. It can be used in textiles. You can have clothing made out of hemp. Um, rope was one of the main things that they used it for in the colonial era. A lot of the ships that brought goods into our harbors and took goods out of our harbors were um, rigged with ropes made from hemp. Uh, hemp can also be used to make paper, building materials, uh, food. There are a lot of other technical products that can be made, like lubricants and fuels and solvents. It can be used in hygiene products and even in auto automobile parts. It's really an amazing product. Next slide, please. So the Farm Bill in 2014 first kind of cracked the door open to allowing American farmers to Re rediscover hemp. Um, but in, under the 2014 bill, the use of hemp was still extremely restricted. It was limited only to growing industrial hemp by research institutes and state departments of agriculture. So it was still very tightly controlled. Um, it was only part of a agriculture, it was a agricultural pilot program. And it was only permitted if the state permitted it. So even though the federal government in 2014, the Agricultural Act said it would be allowed, you still have, had to have state legislation approving it. And again, it was only for research purposes. So it was very limited. Next slide, please. And then in 2018, the federal government finally legalized the cultivation and sale of industrial hemp effective on January 1, 2019. Again, with still with a lot of restrictions, a lot of limitations, but at least now it's, um, it's something that can be done and isn't just restricted to research. The law in 2018 also defines hemp, gives a definition of um, it being the plant species, cannabis sativa L, and any part of the plant. It includes derivatives, extracts, cannabinoids, isomers, acids, and salts. And it defines hemp as having a delta-9 THC concentration of not more than 0.3% on a dry weight basis. Next slide, please. So importantly, the 2018 Farm Bill removed hemp from a from the Controlled Substances Act. So it's no longer a Schedule One controlled substance. And that was the major change in the 2018 Farm Bill. It gave states the authority to regulate the production and sale of hemp and hemp products within their borders. And it also allows there to be a cross-border transfer of hemp. 
So even though it's still tightly regulated, it is at least legal now. Um, the law does maintain the FDA's authority to regulate any products that contain cannabis or cannabis-derived compounds under the um, Food, Food, Drug, and Co Cosmetics Act. And it points out that, um, and it, you know, as we previously mentioned, marijuana is still a Schedule One drug. It's a different variety of the same plant. It has a higher concentration of THC, and it's still considered a Schedule One drug. Next slide, please. This chart is just a, a interesting comparison I thought was kind of a useful tool for the two farm bills um, and how they treat hemp. So under the 2014 farm bill, again, it was for indus hemp was allowed for research purposes only, very tightly controlled, um, and there are a lot of restrictions on it. And then under the 2018 bill, which is the left column, it's allowed, basically U.S. hemp production is allowed, again, with some regulations though. Uh, one important practical aspect is under the 2014 bill, um, this is the very last row, financing um, may not be available through the farm credit system banking institutions, but now under the 2018 bill, financing is available through the farm credit system banking institutions. So that, that I think is a very important change for farmers. Um, next slide, please, and I'll pass it back to Jonathan. Thank you, Anne. So, as we discussed before, the the jurisdiction over the industrial hemp program uh, in the United States, like so many things in the United States, is a patchwork. It's kind of complicated. Congress created the Farm Bill, created the definition of industrial hemp. Um, it created the other requirements in the 2018 Act. However, it left uh, certain enforcement capability to existing federal agencies. Um, and those different federal agencies have different scopes of authority, which makes it uh, sometimes difficult to navigate through what the requirements are, depending on what you're looking at. So for example, one of the requirements is uh, the certification of testing labs for industrial hemp and disposal of non-compliant plants. And we're going to talk about that a little bit more when we talk about the final interim rule, uh, the interim final rule that was passed, uh, uh, promulgated through the USDA. So uh, industrial hemp needs to be tested in accordance with those rules and disposal of non-compliant plants has to take place in accordance with those rules. That comes under the purview of the Drug Enforcement Agency. Um, the Farm Bill also um, left the authority of the Food and Drug Administration through the Food, Drug and Cosmetic Act to continue to oversee food and food supplements and drugs um, pursuant to those that particular act and with regard to industrial hemp. So when, it, when we talk about, and which we're gonna talk about in a little bit, uh, hemp derived extracts for food and supplements, that's under the purview of the Food and Drug Administration. And then the USDA, essentially has authority over the crops themselves, the samples, the testing requirements, uh, as well as approval of state and tribal programs for the um, growing and regulation of industrial hemp. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned, uh, the USDA Agricultural Marketing Service issued its interim final rule uh, uh, in October of uh, 2019. Uh, it's effective through November 1st, 2020. Uh, and that outlines the requirements for the production of industrial hemp in the United States. Now, in that particular rule, states or, or tribal authorities who wish to be the primary regulatory authority in their jurisdiction need to submit a plan to the USDA for approval. And as I mentioned previously, Virginia has submitted its plan, it's received feedback, and they are working on the plan. The uh, interim final rule has particular requirements for uh, state and tribal plans. Um, I've listed some of them there, but some of them that are, that are um, uh, worth discussing in a little bit more detail uh, is the record keeping is one of them. Um, state authorities or tribal authorities have to maintain records for at least three years 
uh, on on the crops and the growers, and it includes legal and, and geospatial location for the crops, including greenhouses. So if if somebody's going to be growing industrial hemp on a greenhouse, uh, they need to include that as well. In addition, licensed hemp producers have to report their crop acreage, not just to the state, but to the USDA Farm Service Agency. Of course, it includes procedures for sampling and testing. But it also requires that any laboratories that are going to be doing testing have to be registered by the DEA. So if there's going to be a laboratory in Virginia that's going to conduct testing on industrial hemp samples, uh, according to the rule and according to the Virginia's plan, they're going to have to um, get registered uh, by the DEA. Uh, they're going to have to be a DEA registered laboratory for testing. Uh, it has requirements for who has to collect samples. Now, as I mentioned previously, Virginia uh, in its testing and sampling is running its program as it did in the previous years. And as I mentioned, it was random sampling um, after this rule takes effect and after um, Virginia's plan takes effect. It's, it's not going to be random anymore. The, the particular interim final rule requires testing uh, within 15 days of production, and it requires uh, uh, testing of all crops. That may change uh, through um, public comment on these rules, but right now it's, it's requiring it 15 days. Um, so that, that process is going to change. One of the other things that the interim final rule requires is that any state or tribal plan has to show that the authority, the government authority, either state or tribal authority, has the resources to uh, enforce their particular plan. So they can't just say we're going to do X, Y, and Z. They have to show that they're going to have the resources, uh, demonstrable resources, sufficient resources to run their particular program. Um, the other thing is, um, the definition of hemp is 0.3% uh, total THC. The interim final rule uh, has a lot of discussion about the THC level, and they talk about negligent violations as opposed to willful violations, and that's something worth, worth looking at. Um, the rule makes clear that hemp producers don't commit a negligent violation of the rule if they produce plants that exceed the acceptable THC concentration level as long as they use reasonable efforts to grow hemp and the plants don't have a THC concentration that exceeds 0.5% on a dry weight basis. And the reason why the USDA said they recognize that hemp producers may take the necessary steps and precautions to produce hemp, yet still produce plants that exceed the acceptable hemp THC level. That's in the interim final rule. Uh, Virginia's plan addresses this. It hasn't been approved yet, so it's important to understand that Virginia is still operating under the old rule, um, and it's 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 still going to be randomized testing. And if it's ab above 0.3%, Virginia can require that it be destroyed. But moving forward, if the plan is approved, uh, they're going, unless of course the interim final rule changes, uh, they're going to allow this acceptable level uh, and this uh, in, in concentration as far as enforcement is concerned. But stay tuned for that because that's that's going to be important to, to, to farmers and grow and growers. Next slide, please. So before we get into um, the last few slides regarding the Food and Drug Administration, CBD and THC. I uh, just wanted to talk a little bit about CBD, uh, cannabidiols and te uh, Delta 9 tetrahydro uh, cannabinol. Um, each of them are over 100 cannabinoids that have been identified in the cannabis plant. There's hundreds of others. CBD can be extracted from both hemp and marijuana, and there's not just CBD, there's CBG, there's CBC, um, but both have the same molecular structure, but the atoms are arranged differently. So this is where there can be some confusion uh, with the general public. This is where there can be some consideration of, um, okay, are you using CBD that's derived, you know, does it have THC in it? Does it not have THC in it? So they can be derived, uh, CBD can be derived both from hemp and marijuana plants. So that's that's a bit of the rub there uh, when we talk about uh, um, CBD products and the FDA stance on certain CBD products. Next slide, please. So uh, here's the current position of the FDA. 
Uh, to date, the FDA has not approved a marketing application for cannabis for the treatment of any disease or condition. However, they have approved multiple uh, cannabis-related drug products and talked about these uh, briefly. Epidiolex, that contains CBD, uh, and that is for the treatment of seizures. Marinol and Syndros uh, contains dronabinol, a synthetic form of THC, THC. Um, there's the distinction for therapeutic uses. And then Sesamet, which contains nabilone, which is a synthetic form of THC. So that's why I wanted to talk about the difference between CBD and THC. Um, aside from those, um, there are no other FDA approved products um, that contain CBD. Um, the FDA is aware that some firms are marketing CBD products to treat diseases, uh, diseases or other therapeutic uses, uh, and they've issued a number of warning letters, which uh, I'm going to mention on one of the last slides. Um, but it's important to remember that the, F uh, the FDA takes the, the position that the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act, that any product intended to have a therapeutic or medical use or any product that's intended to affect the structure or the function of a body, human body or animals, is considered a drug. And that's the position they take. Uh, and they take the position that drugs must either be uh, receive pre-market approval through the FDA or, um, uh, or go through over-the-counter drug review, OTC review. And since CBD was not an ingredient considered under the OTC over-the-counter drug review, they consider it uh, an unapproved drug that can't be distributed or sold in interstate commerce. Now, that's the position of the FDA. Um, you'll, you'll see a lot of newspaper reports. If you go on the FDA website, they'll talk about it a lot, that they're in conversations with state. But that's the, that's the position that the FDA is taking, uh, because even under the 2018 federal farm bill, their authority to regulate drugs uh, and food, drugs, and cosmetics was not removed. They still have uh, oversight and authority over that. Next slide, please. So as I said, um, C FDA has not approved any other CBD or THC for human consumption that I mentioned. It has not approved CBD or THC for use in animals. It has not approved CBD or THC as dietary supplements because they consider those two substances drugs and therefore excluded from the definition of dietary supplements. They've not approved marketing CBD or THC as a dietary supplement or a treatment, and they have not approved the marketing of CBD or THC product of, as having therapeutic benefits as a dietary supplement. Um, I wanna make a distinction here um, of uh, CBD as generally recognized as safe. So the FDA has issued three generally recognized as safe notices um, for products uh, for hemp seed derived food ingredients. Uh, those are the Holt hemp seed, hemp seed protein powder, and hemp seed oil. They have issued uh, statements that they are generally recognized as safe and can be used in food products. Um, the reason is because those products do not contain THC. Um, they have no questions regarding uh, the conclusion that the use of those products are safe. Uh, therefore, they can be used in human food. Um, however, they haven't received any of those notices or issued any statements regarding the use uh, or approving the use of hemp derived ingredients in animal food. So because those products uh, do not naturally contain THC or CBD, um, the FDA sees them as generally recognized as safe. Um, and therefore that is why that those particular products can be marketed. Next slide, please. So as I indicated, uh, the FDA has issued warning letters to firms that market unapproved new drugs that allegedly contain CBD. Um, and it's for the reasons uh, that I mentioned. Those are two examples. If you go on the CBD, uh, the FDA website, you can actually see the substance of those particular letters uh, and the, what they what they're stating. Basically, what they're stating is many of these products uh, 
are being marketed as therapeutic or as supplements and um, the FDA takes the position that uh, CBD and THC are in fact drugs, therefore they're excluded from the definitions, those particular definitions, um, and they have uh, ordered these particular uh, businesses to cease and desist selling those products. Many of these businesses, almost most of these businesses are online businesses, um, and they've been issuing those letters uh, with fairly fair frequency over the last year. Um, it's created a lot of confusion and concern for real retailers, but but that is the state state of uh, the law right now uh, until uh, the FDA comes out with its regulations regarding these particular products. Next slide, please. So the FDA's current position and the reason why they take this position is, uh, according to the FDA, they've seen potential harms with CBD. Uh, they've seen cases of potential liver, liver injury, potential drug interactions, potential male reproductive toxicity, cumulative exposures, effect on populations and use in animals. Again, if you go to the FDA website, you can read their position on that. These are, uh, this is the information they have right now. They are looking at this. They are they are going through the process uh, of of evaluating these particular substances. It's not clear when they're going to come out with any changes in regulations or whether they're going to issue any more statements in the near future. Um, they've been uh, you know dealing with the COVID nineteen uh, pandemic, uh, dealing with all of the issues that occur with that. So it's not clear. Um, what's going to happen yet, but uh, certainly it is a rapidly uh, evolving field and uh, there's a lot of misinformation out there and you should certainly uh, do your research before engaging in any of those types of activities. Uh, next slide. So as everybody knows, CBD products are currently available in many stores pretty much everywhere and online. Um, the FDA takes the position that there's you know, they haven't been validly tested and there's a lack of testing regulations, so it's difficult to know if they're even safe or effective and difficult to know the source of the CBD or quantity without appropriate testing. Um, one of the things uh, that we're going to be talking about in the next session in a couple of weeks is um, there have been a number of lawsuits uh, that have been filed um, re regarding these particular type of products for various reasons, um, not the least of which is individuals who have purchased uh, supposedly THC free products uh, to use for the purposes of CBD oil um, and having used those particular products and then having a, a drug test uh, done by their employer or for example for their commercial driver's license and the drug test comes back positive uh, and they lose their job or they lose their commercial driver's license. Um, some lawsuits have been filed against those particular companies for false claims that their their product was THC free. So, so there's a lot of uh, litigation going on in this area, a lot of uncertainty. So it, it certainly pays to um, do your research and to um, understand what the regulations are, what's out there and um, beware, beware of that. Next slide, please. So I wanted to do this to tee up. We wanted to talk about the next segment briefly before we get into any questions. Um, back in 2019, and, and Anne talked about this at the end of her portion of the presentation regarding banking for the cannabis industry. Uh, back in 2019, the House passed the S Secure and Fair Enforcement Safe Banking Act. Uh, that particular act prohibited federal banking regulators from penalizing uh, depository institutions, banks from providing banking services to legitimate marijuana related businesses. Now, that particular bill, even though it passed the House, was referred to the Senate and it didn't go anywhere. But interestingly enough, um, in the most recent act uh, passed by the House to uh, combat the uh, COVID-19 pandemic, the HEROES Act, COVID-19 release bill, relief bill that was passed uh, last month, May 15, 2020. In that bill is the same legislation, the Safe Banking Act. So that bill is pending. So it appears uh, that that is going to be addressed again. That act has, the HEROES Act has gone over to the Senate for evaluation. So it looks like it's gained traction again uh, and it's going to be um, looked at by the Senate. 
Whether it passes or not uh, with that in that form through the Senate is a question, but it's interesting to note that uh, it is still gaining traction um, and it is uh, still on the forefront of the minds of Congress. Uh, so we'll see what happens with that and um, we should stay tuned. But I think that's a, a perfect segue into the next segment um, because in our next segment, we're going to be talking about things like recent federal legislation, um, the, the issuance of the SBA loans, paycheck protection loans, and how they relate to um, industrial hemp businesses, as well as uh, employment law and uh, contractual law when it relates to uh, cannabis and industrial hemp businesses. So I think that's a perfect segue given what's occurred with COVID-19 in last month and the HEROES Act passed, uh, which included the same bill that was passed out of the House last year to allow legitimate marijuana related businesses to access banking services. So um, next slide, please. So, um, we're happy to take questions uh, right now, uh, Ann and I, if there are any particular questions. Um, I, I'm looking at the... Uh, um, the event. first one, Jonathan, is um, I'm going to go ahead and hit publish on. It's a question regarding HIPAA, and I, I can take this one. Um, and then Jonathan, maybe you can add on if I'm missing anything. So the question is whether there's been an official ruling or any case law from Health and Human Services about whether a dispensary is considered a covered entity under HIPAA, and if so, whether any dispensaries in the U.S. have entered into a consent decree with Health and Human Services for a HIPAA violation. Um, so I'm not aware of any official statement from the Health and Human Services regarding whether a dispensary is a covered entity, but my understanding is that they would consider it to be a, a covered entity. I believe that they have issued some statement that they generally think that medical dis me medical marijuana dispensaries can be covered entities, um, mainly because they um, may receive a medical prescription or in Virginia a certification or some similar document from a medical from a healthcare provider to provide treatment. And for that reason, I believe that Health and Human Services would actually consider it to be a, a dispensary to be a covered health care provider. So that based on that, I would recommend that any dispensary um, to be on the safe side, go ahead and comply with HIPAA and treat any protected health information that they have in their possession as protected health information under HIPAA and take those um, safeguards to prevent um, disclosure and to uh, avoid any violations of HIPAA. Um, but again, I'm not aware of any actual ruling from um, Health and Human Services on that regard. Also, I'm not aware of any consent decrees that they've that they've entered into with any medical marijuana dispensaries. I don't know, Jonathan, if you've heard of any. No, I haven't. Uh, I would agree with you, Anne. I have not heard of any official rulings or any case law or any consent decrees concerning that. But but certainly, it, it, it you know again, it, it, dispensaries have to be careful and they and they should take all precautions as you indicated. The, the next question, I'm going to go ahead and hit publish, and I don't know the answer to this, Jonathan, but maybe you do. The question is whether a hemp cigarette is classified as food. Um, no, I'm not aware that it's classified as food either under federal or state law. Um, I, I do know that hemp cigarettes uh, under state law cannot be sold to someone under 21, um, but I, I'm not aware that it... The state law considers it a it considers it considers it under the same um, statute that discusses the sale of tobacco products. Um, although, if you look at the definition of a hemp derived extract, um, that could consider it could consider it a food. But uh, that's an excellent question. I don't think the state has come out and classified a hemp cigarette as a f as a food. But I'd actually like to look at that uh, r real briefly. And if uh, the person who sent that can shoot me an email, uh, I'll take a look at that a little bit more closely and send them a response back. Okay. If you have any other questions, you can post them now. Um, as we've mentioned, we have a second part to this webinar that's going to offer some more um, practical information regarding the hemp industry. We'll be broadcasting that on June 30th at 10 a.m. You can register on our website. 
for that um, webinar. We will make today's webinar available to the registrants, so expect to see an email from us on that. And looks like there's one more question here. Dovetailing, um, publishing it now. I don't know that I have the answer though. Dovetailing with the HIPAA question, are they subject to 21 CFR 11 electronic records under FDA regulations? I don't know the answer to that. Um, Jonathan, do you? No, I don't. Um, but that's something uh, we could look at if they, whoever posted the question sends us an email. That's an excellent question uh, regarding the dispensaries. Yes, if you want to just go ahead and email that question to us, we can take a look at it and get back to you. Okay. Well, without any other questions, I think we can uh, wrap it up. And I do hope you all will join us on June 30th. And thank you very much for being with us today. Goodbye, Thank everyone. You, everyone.